Welcome. This is Ruth L. Snyder joining you from Bonneville, Alberta, Canada. And I'm happy to be hosting day four of the 12 days of Christmas with my author friends. Some of these friends I have just met and others I've known for a while. So I'm happy to introduce them to you. And I thought this was would be a great way for some of you to learn about people that you haven't heard about before and hear about other books that are available. If you have readers on your Christmas list, it's not too late to order some books. So that's why I decided to do that for the 12 days. I do have Phil Rosencrantz with me tonight and so I'm going to bring him onto stage with me and we will have a bit of discussion and then see if anybody else joins us tonight. Welcome, Phil. Ah, thank you. Nice to be here. All right. I'm glad to have you with me again. So what, anything that you would like to discuss tonight as far as your writing or your book? Um, well, there, there's one, there's a couple big surprises that I found when I was writing my book, things that weren't on my radar. Okay. And, uh, they're kind of very interesting, I think. So maybe that would be something that, you know, viewers would, would kind of find interesting. Sure. And so it ended up in the book, uh, <laughs> the book about my uncle, the paratrooper who was missing in action in World War II. But mm -hmm. uh, this isn't directly related to my uncle. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, what I discovered in studying my uncle was uh, he was a paratrooper and the training of paratroopers, what paratroopers do, it's all totally different than any other military unit. They jump out of planes in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't know who they're going to be with when they land. They don't know what where they're going to be usually because they're World War II. They were usually misdropped, not totally, but at least at the beginning. All both of my uncles, how uh, my uncle's first drop was misdropped. But um, the the guru behind the paratroopers was General. James Gavin. Okay. And so I studied him and his his leadership style, how he developed with other people helping him, uh, what a paratrooper should do or could do. Um, and my uncle became part of the group of non-commissioned officers that tried out a lot of these methods and then eventually were trained. And um, so uh, one of the things I learned uh, about studying General mm -hmm. Gavin was something very interesting. Uh, when they dropped into the Netherlands mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they fought the Germans, the Germans destroyed much of the city of Nijmegen where they landed. It was fighting going on, retaliation against the Dutch, and a couple of thousand people died because of the shellacking of Nijmegen. Eight months before that, mm -hmm. the city of Nijmegen suffered because uh, some American bombers had flown to Germany on a mission, got to where they were, almost to where they were going, bad weather forced them to turn around. And when they do that, they're always prepared for what they call secondary missions. You know, why waste a good plane trip when you could, you know, <laughs> bomb somebody else? Right. I won't go into the details, but they accidentally bombed downtown Nijmegen. Oh, wow. And killed 850 Dutch people. So it was a tragedy, hmm. you know, totally unintended. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so after the war, here's General Gavin. 
he felt bad about what had happened to the city of Nijmegen, the friendly fire accident, and then the battle. Uh, now, the, the Dutch were very forgiving, and they knew that we were on their side, we were liberating them, but he felt bad. So he got together with people in the city of Albany, New York. Apparently, there's a Dutch community there, but I'm not sure that was the total reason, but he had a connection. And they asked, the city of Nijmegen, what do you need? Because they were just really decimated. And they collected 300 tons of clothing, medicine, school supplies, building materials, um, anything like that. And they put them on two cargo ships and shipped them to Nijmegen wow. in 1947. Wow. And uh, the last time we were in Nijmegen, they they were honoring General Gavin. His daughter was there, and they were putting up memorial plaques at the location of the docks where they unloaded all the cargo ships. And a woman, uh, who I now know, well, I've known her for a while, Dutch woman, she started a foundation called the Friendship between Albany, Albany and Nijmegen, F-A-N, F-A-N. And mm -hmm. there's, they've been sister cities. They're like the first sister cities, Albany and Nijmegen. Oh, wow. And uh, children from high school, high schools in Nijmegen visit Albany. Children from high schools in Albany visit Nijmegen. And there's, there's pen pals going on. And uh, so it, it's a lesson that, you know, we all talk about how terrible war is, it shouldn't have happened, and we give all these glittering generalities, makes us, tries to make us feel good, they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. But here's General Gavin that did something, mm -hmm. you know? So even after tragedy, as bad as it is, and as much as we lament mm -hmm. and pontificate, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's something we can do. Some good can come out of it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so uh, I, I just thought that was a great example, one of the better examples I've seen of somebody helping and doing something mm -hmm. after a tragedy to try and have some good happen. So I don't know. Now, I probably dragged that out. but I No, that's I, great. Thanks for sharing that story. Yeah. I'm. Do you need to go and answer somebody? Uh, no, I... I think I'm okay. Okay. I'm, you can put me on the side, whatever you need to do. Or bring <laughs> other, I, don't, I don't know what your agenda is, so whatever it is. Well, I'm adding Yamina to the ah. screen here. Hello. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Good. So, I Yamina, know. I think that we could carry on the thread of discussion around um, good coming out of terrible circumstances because... I think that's something that you talk about in your writing too, isn't it? It is. Um, it's not around war, but sometimes it can probably feel like war. It's about relationships and um, making the best out of the relationships you have. Uh, I, I use the term chosen because nothing is accidental. So for some reason we are in those relationships and um it can sometimes feel like war, but we do manage to figure out which road we need to take or what is the next move that we need to take with that. But um, your war sounds really serious. Were you in that action? I'm, I'm assuming that you were because I missed the beginnings. No. no, this was in World War II and my uncle was in the war. Okay. So it's a book about my uncle. Oh, okay. All right, I'm going to add Julie to the stream as well. Good evening, Julie. Hi there. Hello. Hello. So we were just talking about how good can come out of terrible circumstances. And I think that's a theme that comes out through your writing as well, isn't it? 
Definitely. I don't, I can't think of, I, I can't imagine, I hope I'll never go through anything worse than losing the love of my life to cancer and, mm. you know, rebuilding my life after that. But um, it certainly is interesting to look back and, you know, realize where I was and where I am now and, you know, remarried with a, an amazing new soulmate. And um, I, I write quite often in my book about holding joy and sorrow in the same space at the same mm. time. And um, as I was coming out of the deepest part of my grief, um, I remember a moment when I thought to myself, wow, that's what's happening right now. I'm feeling joy. And it's in the midst of this very, very deep sorrow. And they're coexisting. Mm -hmm. So. That is an interesting um, thing because you don't often feel like joy and grief go together. Mm -hmm. um, but that too is... Um, just the way life works. Like you, you may be in this stage, but you do find that there are opportunities to be in a different space all at the same time. But um, you don't really think about that a lot of the times. No, and I also, I think lucky for me, I have had the philosophy my whole life that everything that happens in my life is there to teach me. And mm -hmm. that nothing that happens is either good or bad, except that I assign right. those terms to it. And right. when you can, and that's part of the thrive process, when you can take a, a meta view and, and a step away and look at, okay, this is what's happened. What am I supposed to learn from this? Or what is this teaching me? Um, it's a whole different perspective and it can really totally change your life. It's not easy to do, especially in the middle right. of something horrible. Right. You, know? you just got rear-ended by somebody just stop and go, okay. <laughs> what am I learning from this? But the truth is five people can get in the same accident and everybody has a different response. So yes. that really is the way you respond that in mm -hmm. life, not what happens to you. That is so true. Yes. I often have said to my kids, we cannot control what happens to us, but we can choose how we respond. Exactly. That's the only thing we can choose sometimes. And it definitely makes the difference in what your outcome is. It does. Yeah, it does. All right. So now that we have a few more people here, why don't, um, does, does everybody have a reading that they are ready to share tonight? Yes. Okay. So maybe we'll let Yamina go first tonight and then Phil and then Julie, and then I will bring up the rear. Okay. So I am reading a blog post that I wrote earlier in the year titled Tenacity. One word, tenacity is the power and the ability to hold on no matter what. The dictionary says tenacity is the fact, the quality or fact of being able to grip something firmly, grip. The quality or fact of being very determined, determination. The quality or fact of continuing to exist, persistence. What a wonderful word. What a horrible word. But tenacious is what we are. You, me, us, all of us. We hold on tight to whatever it is we are believing in at any moment in time. Nothing can dissuade us from the thing we have chosen to hold on to. Nothing. And it is a good thing. This is the power of choice, and we are always choosing. There is absolutely no right or wrong in this because it is personal. Personal to you, personal to me, personal to each and every one of us. I cannot make you let go of the thing you are tenaciously holding on to, nor can you make me. How powerful is that? How powerful are you? Yes, we can be judged for whatever and even everything we tenaciously hold on to. Judgment doesn't matter. When you don't care about what someone thinks or says about you, that is true power and absolute freedom. You will not bend or break to mold to any outside force. Hold tight to your beliefs. They serve you in whatever capacity you are needing in this moment. 
Tenacity is an awesome ability to develop and strengthen. The good thing about tenacity, as in all things, is that we will in time come to know if the thing we are fiercely holding on to is worth our time and energy. As the very wise saying goes, you will never get it done and you will never get it wrong. This means you will forever grow and evolve. So go for it. Since we can never truly know what is right or wrong with someone else, do what you do with everything you have to give. In other words, be as tenacious as you can be. Give your everything for that which you believe in because you will never get it done and you will never get it wrong. You will hit the pavement or you will soar. Either way, you will give all you have to give to living your life. There is no life without something to believe in, something to fully commit to, something to hold as life or death to you, because it is. You will die trying or you will die because you did not try. Own your life, be tenacious, and give it every, everything you have to give. Your very life depends on it. No judgment. You are absolutely free to own every belief, every choice, and every decision. There isn't any other way, and no one can change it, no matter how hard they try. Here's to you, to your tenacity, to holding on to your beliefs, and to being the most powerful awesome you that you already are. Heart-based sharing. Peace, love, blessings. That is my sharing for today. Thank you, Yamina. You're welcome. Cassidy, yes. Keep, we need to keep going even when it's tough, don't we? Yes, have to keep going. It's your belief until you decide it isn't anymore. <laughs> and sometimes we find out we're stronger than we think we are, especially when we rely on God. That's um, in the the outcome of adversity, um, as with the gentleman, I, Mr. Rosenblatt, is it? Rosencrantz, yes. Rosencrantz, sorry about the name. Um, yes, in his story, it's all about tenacity and... Um, coming out of the adversity and having a better outcome or having an outcome that does work. Right. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. All right. So I'm going to bring Phil Rosencrantz back on and he's going to share a little bit more from his book with us. Okay. Um, I, I picked a section, it's not very long, <clears throat> and it, it, as I studied my uncle, studied paratroopers, read his letters, and learned more, it, it just became more amazing to me that here are these guys, I mean, I don't know how they recruited them, I mean, what did they say, oh, how would you like to jump out of a plane in the middle of the night? Uh, to God knows who knows where, uh, landing in uh, w maybe in the middle of the enemy, uh, and you don't know who you're with, and, um, and 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 you may have to change your mission along the way. Uh, who wants to do that? Come join us. You know, I'm thinking, how did they recruit these guys um, to do that? I mean, they. They, they even knew a certain percentage of them that jumped out of the plane wouldn't make it to the ground alive for a number of reasons, or they would hit the ground and die immediately. And so in my book, I wanted to put something about that. And of course, I didn't have a quote from my uncle uh, about his personal jump uh, in Sicily or in uh, Nijmegen. Um, but his jump into Sicily, he was 
captured by 200 Italians, and I read about that the other day. But um, I, but this is a paragraph that's uh, a, a, a portion that's about that. Um, and this is a quote from a paratrooper, um, Ken Russell, uh, about his jump um, during uh, D-Day. Um, F Company paratrooper, F Company troopers got the green light as they were approaching St. Mary Glees when Ken Russell got to the doorway. The first thing he saw was the beacon of the large fire of a large fire. He had his first jolt of real fear when he realized that he might land in the burning building. Russell had an eerie view of the entire scene during the first few seconds it took for the parachute to descend. Charles Blankenship, the PFC from North Carolina, was drawn toward the fire by the drafts. He screamed once as he plunged into the two-story inferno. Russell, Russell cringed as he looked down from 200 feet on the heads of Germans who were unshouldering their rifles and firing into the air. Ridiculous as it was, he tried to hide behind his reserve parachute strapped across his belly. His friends, Kadish, Klapa, and Bryant got hung up on the telephone poles or on the tall linden and chestnut trees that lined the square, shot dead before they could react. They hung there as if crucified. Russell looked down past his feet and saw the church below him. He pulled on his risers, hoping to slip clear of the building, but he hit hard on the roof and began rolling. He was a tangle of equipment in parachute as he rolled and could not stop himself. Finally, his chute caught on the top of the roof and came to a stop right at the edge. So anyway, I just marvel at what our fighting forces did in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. I think those of us that weren't there, we just don't really have a clue as to mm -hmm. what those people went through. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Wow. Some of those descriptions, a two story inferno. Yeah. Hung as if crucified. <laughs> yeah. War is horrible and we can Im try to imagine, but I don't think we even know half of what they went through. Yeah. So, the first 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan is um, where they uh, landed on the beach on D-Day. And it's it shows, you know, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. But then people, other people said, yeah, it was horrible, but it was worse than that. <laughs> worse than they portrayed. Yeah. So anyway, um, thought I'd share that in the... Well, thank you for sharing that with okay. us and reminding us of the sacrifice that so many people made so that we can live in the freedom that we have today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The uh, paratroopers had a particular role. And if you think about it for a moment, you realize that we may not have won the war in Europe without them. <clears throat> it's mm. their job was to drop in the night before an assault to try and distract the enemy so that our guys could deploy. They could land on the beach okay. or whatever it is. Right. And so that's what their job was to take out major weapons, mm. uh, just <clears throat> create havoc and uh, stuff like that. And, uh, it, that was vital mm -hmm. for the assault landings. And uh, right. people don't realize that. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Julie, I'll bring you back in. Hey. Hi. So um, I'm reading from my book, Weathering the Grief Storm. And mm -hmm. um, it's about losing my husband to cancer and then finding my life after that and uh, the the process the thrive process that i developed to help me get through that 
And I'm going to read from, um, this was kind of the, the middle of his cancer journey, the, this section of the book. Someone told me when John was diagnosed that being the caregiver of a cancer patient is like a full-time job. I didn't really believe it at the time. Trust me, it's true. Only the, the, only, only the other full-time jobs in your life, like your actual job or your kids or your aging parents, don't go away. It impacted every part of my life and the lives of my kids and those closest to me. It's an unseen but very real side effect of cancer. In fact, cancer comes into your life like an uninvited guest. It takes up residence, stealing the master suite for its own, whether you like it or not. An extremely needy and impolite guest, it invades your space, your thoughts, your time, and your daily existence. It decides how your day, your week, or your month goes. It demands that you change your plans at the drop of a hat and decides whether or not you work that day. It doesn't care if your kids are sick, your parents need your support, or your boss or client is expecting you to finish a job by a deadline. <clears throat> it's selfish and it doesn't care. Worst of all, you can't circle a date on the calendar looking forward to its departure. It may never leave. It removes your core stability, making the ground beneath your feet that was once solid and firm movable and unstable. Just see if you can get your footing, it taunts. Feeling a little too comfortable with your life? Settling into a new normal? No worries, cancer takes care of that for you. You better learn to dance through the chaos because there's gonna be chaos. In the blink of an eye, things will change again. You'll have to adapt to a new set of challenges. Your life will turn. Surviving an uninvited guest requires a sense of humor and diligence as you pay attention to the rare times when the guest is out or sleeping and you can reclaim your space for a little while. This new constant presence that may never go away requires every coping tool you've ever learned. And some days I found that just making it through the day as I navigated around this uninvited guest was the best that I could hope for. At the end of the day, as the incredibly resilient Lena Horn once said, it's not the load that breaks you down, it's the way you carry it. Being the one who loves someone with cancer may be harder than having it yourself. I can't say for sure because I've never been diagnosed, but I've loved three very important people in my life through it, and it sucks. It's scary and hard and all encompassing. Most days while John was sick, what I really wanted to do the minute I woke up to the reality that the beautiful, perfect for me man lying next to me in bed remain, had terminal cancer was pull the sheets up over my head and go back to sleep. So it all just went away. The reality of my life was that lots of people relied on me and I couldn't afford to give up or give in. So I chose to carry that what felt like a very heavy load with gratitude and grace and as much strength as I could draw from all the incredible blessings in my life. It was a daily choice and some days came more easily than others. I began to develop a pattern for surviving this emotional firestorm that was, that was our, our, now our new life. The first part of that is the first step in the thrive process, trusting myself. I learned to really listen to my intuition. More than once, I allowed that still small voice inside me to guide me, trusting that it knew better than I did what was best for me and for us. That uninvited guest, hey? For sure. And I um, truly believe that that intuition is the way that God communicates with me. I feel mm -hmm. I always believe that. And I get what I call God hits or intuitive hits. You know, like a, one time I literally got the hit to give my car to some friends. <laughs> that um, It's never anything that is sort of I've thought through or, or it just hits me generally. And I, I really, I listen to that because I feel strongly that that is really how, you know, God is communicating with me. Mm. And um, there were so many times during John's cancer journey when my intuition was leading and I just said, okay, I, I have to trust that this is the right thing to do. And it always was. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. I really, I wrote down some of the phrases that you used cancer taunts. But you need to learn to dance through the chaos. Because there's surviving, no chaos. Yeah. <laughs> surviving demands a sense of humor. And especially that quote you gave, um, it's not the load that breaks you, but the it's way, the you, way you carry it. That's not my quote. Lena Horn said that, but it really is true. 
And it goes back to what we were talking about a bit earlier, right? It's we can't choose what happens to us, but we can choose how we respond to it. And I have to say, I feel so completely blessed that I was able to go through this experience with the most patient, amazing, mm. faithful, positive human being on the planet. And, and I mean, most of the time I was the one breaking down and he was the one saying, it's going to be okay. You know, mm. I've had a great life. It's, I, I know what's going to happen after I die. I'm fine. It's, you know, I mean, it just, I'm, I'm very, very blessed. And he had a great sense of humor. Like he was always making totally irreverent jokes that made me <laughs> really uncomfortable. And, just be like <laughs> well you, you know you either laugh or cry right <laughs> that's it exactly yeah that's it well thank you for sharing with us and for uh, choosing to respond in a way that is helpful for others as well absolutely thanks for having me you're welcome Oof, I feel like we've had uh, a whole Sunday service already. <laughs> Lots to think about. <laughs> I am going to uh, shift the mood a little bit, although what I've picked to read, what I've picked to read is fiction, but it also um, has some of the same messages that we've been talking about tonight. So this comes from a book, and um, I participated in this project several years ago. And it's called The 12 Days of Christmas. Um, 12 authors contributed a 10,000 words. Each of us contributed 10,000 word stories to the book. And they're all Christmas stories, but all very different from each other. And I chose to write a story that was um, with the setting of Botswana, because that's where I spent some of my early years. And um, Anyway, I'll just share a little piece from it. it. The story is called Cecile's Christmas Miracle. Cecile followed Nasa out of the gap in the fence and carefully blocked the opening with a jagged piece of tin and some logs. It was only eight in the morning, but already the sun was beating down. It may be December, but that meant it was the middle of summer in the Kalahari. The only ice or snow Cecile would find here would be in the propane freezer she had insisted on bringing with her. Cecile pulled her felt hat tighter onto her head to protect herself from the assault of the sun. Even though the hat was hot, her fair skin didn't fare well without it. Her long-sleeved cotton blouse and loose-fitting floor-length skirt also provided much-needed protection. In the past few days, the temperatures had hovered between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius during the day. Nights would cool down, if you can call it that, to between 10 and 20 degrees, only plummeting to the freezing mark occasionally during the African winter months of June and July. Cecile clambered into the driver's seat of her rickety Land Rover and gestured to Nasa to sit in the passenger seat. Although infrastructure was progressing well in other parts of Botswana, in large part due to the diamond industry. Here at the village outside Mabutsani, the dirt trail roads were still impassable unless you had a four wheel drive. The monster rumble, rumbled to life and grumbled as Cecile shifted into gear. Cecile was making good use of the mechanical knowledge she had gained growing up on her parents' mixed farm. It was a good thing she knew the basics of maintenance, like changing oil and checking transmission fluid. If there were major issues, the closest mechanic was hours away. Out here, she was considered the expert at many things because she was the only white person who lived in the village. She still shuddered to think she was regarded as the medical expert in this area. She only had a nursing degree. The nearest major hospital, was only 300 kilometers away in Khabarone, but with the roads the way they were, it took almost five hours to drive there. Flying Mission provided the only ambulance service by airplane in the area, and Cecile had been instructed to use the service only for extreme emergencies due to the cost. The local language was a fascinated combination of clicks, strange vowels, and tones that still left Cecile muddled. That's why Nasa was her translator. Nasa was one of the few women who had been outside the village and had learned rudimentary English. 
A cloud of dust announced their arrival at the clinic, a bare mud brick structure with simple glass windows and a tin roof. Government officials had indicated a brand new clinic would soon be built, but that was before talk of resettlement. A long queue of people waited at the clinic door. Babies wailed and children with runny noses and coughs clung to their mothers. They were kept company by people with tubercul tuberculosis who came every day for their medication. The blank looks bothered Cecile the most. These people didn't seem to understand that each of them was a unique individual created on purpose by a loving God. Do you? Her conscience taunted her. Cecile gritted her teeth. Yes, I do. Nasa gave her a puzzled look. You do? What do you mean? Cecile chuckled. Sorry, Nasa. I was just talking to myself. Nasa shook her head and opened the door of the Jeep. Cecile grabbed her purse and followed suit. Judging by the long line of people, it was going to be another exhausting day. Cecile's first patient was a toddler, a little girl no more than two years old with second and third degree burns on her left shoulder and arm. Through Nasa, Cecile caught the broken story. She put daughter close to fire, keep warm. It's not that cold at night yet. Why didn't she just give her daughter a blanket? Nasa sighed. She no have blanket. Tears formed in Cecile's eyes as she gently cleaned the burns. Every time Cecile touched the toddler, the little girl winced and whimpered. Cecile spoke in a soft, soothing tone, even though she knew the girl could not understand what she said. Hopefully, her body language and tone would communicate what the little girl needed to know. Nasa and the girl's mother hold, held the toddler still while Cecile worked. When the burns were clean, Cecile applied some antimicrobial cream to the red weepy wounds and then wrapped the shoulder and arm with non-stretch roller gauze. Cecile handed a bar of soap and a tube of cream to the girl's mother. Tell her she needs to wash the burns every morning and put cream on in the morning and at night. Nasa nodded. A heated discussion ensued between Nasa and the mother. Why is she arguing with you? She says no water in home. I say she needs some. Cecile grimaced. Why can't she get some from the borehole? She say men come in trucks and destroy borehole. She say they empty tank of water to ground. They tell people must move. Move where? I tell later. You have water? If not, no washing. Cecile retrieved her canteen and handed it to the mother. I'm not sure how many gifts I'll be getting this Christmas, but I can share what I have. Looking directly into the mother's eyes, she said, here, take my water. When you need more, come get some more from the clinic, rain barrel. Nasa translated. The mother accepted the canteen with two hands and dipped her head in thanks. Then, tears dripping down her face, she shook Cecile's hand and left. Cecile glanced up at a plaque on the wall, Matthew 25, 35 to 36. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the reminder that I'm actually serving you every time I bind up a wound. Give me wisdom and strength to be a servant to these people. So that's just a short part of Cecile's Christmas Miracle. I'm going to bring the other people back onto the screen and we'll have another discussion. So we've talked a little bit about choice, how we can choose how we respond, even if the circumstances are very difficult. We've talked about God bringing good things out of bad things. Any other themes we've noticed in the readings tonight? I um, feel like Julie 
had a lot of tenacity and definitely came through adversity in mm. a major way. Um, I've never had to, actually I knew someone who did pass away from cancer and she was a larger woman to begin and she just became very frail. She tried all kinds of different things and um, she still succumbed to the cancer. But outside of that, I mean, it, it's a full-time job. There were friends who you had to go and feed her and mm -hmm. um, just clean clean her up. And her chemo took a whole lot out of her. She had no energy for anything. So um, yes, it is an uninvited guest mm -hmm. that does not go away. And, um, but you got through the adversity and are actually thriving. So that's a wonderful thing. Well, I, you know, about, I don't know, maybe a week or so after John died when I was, and I've never been a depressed person. You know, I've, I've, I've never really understood depressed people. Like it's just never really resonated with me. And then I definitely went through a period of time when I was depressed certainly right after he died. And I remember, you know, just laying in bed and my, I didn't really have, you know, my, my youngest son was a high, high school senior about to graduate. I didn't have a lot of responsibility for other people in my life. I had a dog, but um, I just, I just didn't think I could get up that day. I just thought I can't do this. And um, I did get really sick right after he died, which I think was my body's way. Nobody had, none of us had gotten sick the whole two and a half years. He had cancer and I got the worst mm -hmm. like flu, but this was after that. And I was about to make the choice to just give myself the day and just stay in bed. And I swear my late husband, I, I just pictured him standing by the bed going, get up, you're not <laughs> doing this. No, I'm not gonna be responsible for you falling into a hole. Uh -uh. You get up, you get dressed, you put on your makeup. And if that's all you do, I mean, I could literally hear him giving me a <laughs> And you know, there wasn't a single day when I just stayed in bed, except when I was sick. Mm. Um, but I mean, from, you know, once that two weeks it was over, I just got up every day and some days it was brutally hard, but you know what? That's tenacity. That's the word. And and it is a choice. It's always a choice. It doesn't mean that it's easy, mm -hmm. right? but, and I just wanted to get through the, the worst grief part early on. Like I dove in head first. I read all the books. I went to all the counseling. I, you know, cause I wanted to get through that part. Mm. Yeah. I agree with you. It's, um, you know, it's hard, but it's also, and I'll tell you something else. A cancer patient, full-time job, just dealing with the insurance, even before oh. he was, mm. the point where I had to take care of his physical needs was almost a full-time job. Just the doctor's appointments, insurance, I mean, all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My friend lost her house and her mother survived her. So the mother had to leave her home. She had no place to live. Yeah. She wow. ran through all of the money yeah. and still didn't have enough to cover it. So yeah. it is an insidious situation. Yes. My husband was 51 when he died and we never got around to getting uh, life insurance. It was on my list. Yeah. And um, he left me with $25,000 in medical debt and that was it. Wow. So, but I persevered. You did. Perseverance, yes. And, and thank goodness for John telling you to get up. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Any other themes, comments? Well, there, <clears throat> there was a theme that I put a Bible verse over in the chat that popped out when we were talking. Uh, I think Julie was talking. Mm -hmm. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes uh, you're in a situation where somebody is rejoicing, you know, something great's going on and you, you want to, and you're happy for them. And then, it, you know, in the same time, you have another friend or relative where it, tragedy is going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I had a <clears throat> experience with that this year during COVID. Um, mm. <clears throat> our our daughter, well, we had two ch grandchildren born during COVID. Uh, our daughter, one of our daughters 
had a little girl. Just the cutest thing, healthy, happy, sharp, just so much fun. And our son and his wife had a baby. She lasted four days. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was six months ago. They're still mourning. Mm -hmm. um, and so my wife and I, here we are, we're, you know, we're rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And it, it, I mean, that just made that Bible verse so real for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, it's, it, it really keeps you thinking. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I, I felt that was a theme that popped out to me when, during the discussions. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that with us, Phil. I think there's a lot of people that can identify with that now with COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the death of a child is always difficult. But yes, I think all of us have found another layer of struggle with COVID. You know, like we've been cut off from visiting other people. Sometimes we've not been able to fellowship with other believers the way we used to. And that just complicates grief. Yeah, it does. Um, there were some funerals uh, and memorial services that just didn't happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of them, I, uh, two of them I saw on Zoom, but there were others. They just said, well, we're not going to do anything. <laughs> hmm. Well, I felt like there was grief in your story, Ruth, with Cecily and the little girl hmm. um, to be burned and being at that age, she can't even really express herself outside of crying or emotions and just body language. Mm -hmm. And to have to deal with um, people that had no hope, um, mm -hmm. just only enough hope to come to look for some help. And mm -hmm. um, seems like her situation was pretty meager. She didn't have a lot to give, but she gave. Mm -hmm what she mm -hmm. had to give, and it made a difference in someone else's life. Mm -hmm. um, probably the whole family. Um, mm -hmm. So again, adversity shows up in all different kinds of ways. It is uninvited. Mm -hmm. And um, the tenacity is there like, to keep going, to keep going, to make that choice, to want to make a difference, to be mm -hmm. there for others. Mm -hmm. So um, there were a lot of threads that in the stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the reason I wrote the story was because I think so often we take so much for granted here in North America. Yeah. And I grew up um, having the opportunity to see people who didn't have you know, they barely had food to eat some days, um, no water sometimes. Um, and yet, so generous. They would literally give you the shirt off their back if they thought you needed it. Yeah. And it really does. When, you hear, when I hear stories like that, it really makes me, you know, stop and have a moment of gratitude mm. for you know, things we do take for granted. You know, like when I go, when I go to bed at night, I stop and, and say thank you for this amazing, comfortable bed and the fact that I'm mm -hmm. full and, you know, um, mm -hmm. I think it's really incumbent on us, especially in this country, especially, you know, those of us that are fortunate enough to be able to live in a house and pay our bills and to really do that. And I know during COVID, we, we have um, small grandchildren and, and we had a grandchild who was a year, he turned... He turned a year actually during COVID and um, his parents just said, we're going to be very, very careful. And if you want to see him, you have to be a part of our bubble, which means you don't go anywhere. You have your groceries delivered, you quarantine your mail. I mean, like they were not joking. 
Mm-hmm. And so we were using instant card and, you know, all that stuff. And we always tipped like 40%, you know, because we could, we could, you know, we had the luxury of be able to stay at home and mm-hmm. do our jobs from here. And mm-hmm. there were these people out, you know, putting themselves in harm's way, going to the grocery store for us, whatever. And so we, we just felt like it was incumbent upon us to, to share that blessing as much as we possibly could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, that is, that is a big part of, you know, I tithe. And, and the reason I tithe is because I feel strongly that that's what I'm called to do. Mm-hmm. And I don't tithe to a church necessarily. I tithe to the, the organization or the person or whatever that, um, that inspires me. But mm-hmm. I know that what I give circulates back to me in a myriad of different ways. So there's always room for more kindness, isn't there? <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. I know Ruth mentioned that she has a gratitude journal, a journal dedicated just to gratitude. But the moment you wake up, or even like you said, before you go to bed, you have to give thanks. You've got to be thankful because especially living here in North America or Canada or um, in this society, we have so much. And even mm-hmm. when we feel like maybe um, we there could be more that we can have in our lives, we've got way more than so many other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Any other thoughts? Lots to think about tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you each of you for coming and sharing your hearts and your stories. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Thank you for the container. Pardon? Thank you for the container. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Yeah. You're very welcome. Okay. So I'm going to sign off from the broadcast. We will be back. Some of us will be back tomorrow night to share with you again. Thank you for those of you who have joined us. And we hope that we have been a blessing to you in some way. Yes. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a great evening.